We're going to talk about what has happened in Ukraine on this day of the Russian invasion. We'll examine the actions and the strategies, both military and political. Now, if this is your first time watching, my name is Darren Gertis. I'm a professor who has built multiple leadership programs at Charleston Southern University. So we'll also view these events through the lens of leadership. And I also wrote a book about Zelensky called I Need Ammunition, Not a Ride, and you can find it on Amazon. Okay, it's day 97, and here's what's going on. About 12 to 13 percent of the population of Severodonetsk uh, still remains in the city, and that's uh, 12 to 13 percent too much. The city is just being hammered, um, and so residents uh, should have gotten out. They probably are trapped now. There are some in, uh, you know, hiding in Soviet-era bunkers underneath the ground. Um, the Russians attacked from three directions at once. They overwhelmed the city. And so they fell back to this kind of industrial center. And it's kind of looking like Mariupol all over again. Uh, I hope it doesn't become that kind of thing. But the, the defenders are in this industrial area where they have these heavy bunkers that uh, under a chemical factory, which is just, just sounds terrible uh, under a chemical factory. Um, but these bunkers were made to withstand Cold War kind of nuclear bombing. So hopefully they can regroup uh, shortly. Okay, in other news, the occupying forces switch the Kurzan and Zaporizhia regions over from uh, Ukrainian to Russian internet and mobile phone network. This is like another step to Russify, to, you know, kind of absorb them, to, you know, turn liberation into annexation. Uh, and so that that's bad. In his daily speech, um, Zelensky, you know, hit the same theme about how you know, we're all president now, right? I said, um, everyone on all levels must now be lobbyists for the supply of modern heavy weapons and artillery to our state. All those systems that can really speed up the victory in Ukraine. And he said, this, the, this narrative of the need to provide Ukraine with enough, enough weapons to win must be maintained constantly. And I work for this every day. And he does. I mean, every day he's He's beating the drums in the same thing. I've read every speech that Zelensky has made since the beginning of the war. I mean, all the ones posted officially on his website. Um, and I, I'm up to like 500 pages of reading. And he, he does keep saying the same thing again and again. We need weapons. We need these sanctions. We need the Russians to, to know that if they do this thing, they will be defeated and destroyed. And the, they're destroying themselves in the process. Okay, in other news, Charles Mitchell, uh, he's the president of the European Council. He announced that the EU agreed to eliminate 90% of Russian oil by 2023, cutting, quote, cutting a huge source of financing for its war machine. Okay, so that's by the end of the year, um, which may be too little too late, but at least it's something. It, this is good news for Europe in general, because Europe has been dependent on Russian oil, and because of their dependence on Russian oil, Russia kind of had the upper hand. So even if, regardless of the war, this is a good thing for Europe, and I think the Europeans understand that. Um, they were a little bit too dependent on, like the Nord Stream 2, when that came out, there, there was a lot of talk about like, hey, you're going to be even more dependent on Russian oil, but they didn't care because they were getting the oil cheap. So that's good for the Europeans. Whether it'll help the Ukrainians, that's an open question. Um, Zelensky praised this effort, saying the practical result is minus tens of billions of euros, which Russia will now be unable to use to finance terror. Uh, that, that's a good perspective. Um, now, remember, Russia is basically a big gas station masquerading as a state. And as John McCain famously said, and a third of the Russian budget comes from the sale of this Russian oil. And can't they just sell it to China? Yes, but it's cost prohibitive to do it. They have to put it in tankers and go around. There's no like no direct pipeline to China. So uh, it'll take years for them to be able to do that, although China will probably start buying up a bunch of it. The African Union is now concerned uh, that the Ukraine conflict will lead to famine, and they should be concerned about that because that's exactly what's going to happen. So Senegal's president, who is the head of the African Union, his name is Macky Sall, uh, he chaired the, the African Union this year. Uh, he said, the worst is perhaps ahead of us if global food supply trends continue. Now, he's right. Zelensky said in his speech today, uh, uh, the inhabitants of the African and Asian countries are used by the Russian state as simply a bargaining chip. That's right. They're holding this over the West head to say, see, these people are going to starve because of your sanctions. Well, 
your sanctions are brought about by your aggression to Ukraine. So, uh, yeah, uh, but they're they're using it as a bargaining chip. Um, the foreign minister uh, from Ukraine, Dmitry Kaluba, said that Russia is playing hunger games with the world's food by blocking Ukrainian food from exports. And they're either blocking it or stealing it or destroying it. And so they are. They're playing hunger games. OK, so that's all that I have for day 97. Stay tuned for day 98. Hey, if this video was helpful, hit like to help others find it in YouTube's algorithm. Subscribe so that you can stay informed. And one more thing, if you are moved to contribute to the humanitarian aid for Ukraine, I have a link below for Samaritan's Purse. If you want to give, be sure to give only to reputable organizations. There's a lot of scammers out there. Thanks for your time.